The Amazon basin is seven million square kilometers in area. And within it, five and a half million square kilometers remains almost entirely unstudied by archaeologists. We've done world archaeology, but we've just ignored the Amazon. What we find in the Amazon are thousands of henges that are now beginning to emerge from the cleared area of the jungle and others that have been identified for the first time with LIDAR. Discoveries of ancient civilizations in the Amazon jungle have unveiled a complex and sophisticated history that challenges previous assumptions about the region. These discoveries, made through a combination of aerial surveys, satellite imagery, and ground expeditions, reveal the existence of large, well-planned urban settlements, extensive road networks, and advanced agricultural techniques suggesting a much higher level of social organization and environmental management than previously thought. The Kuhikugu complex in the upper Xingu region of the Brazilian Amazon offers an incredible glimpse into the advanced urban planning and societal organization of pre-Columbian civilizations long before European contact. Nestled in the remote Amazon basin in present-day Mato Grosso, Brazil, this area is a treasure trove of biodiversity. The dense rainforests and network of rivers likely played a key role in the development and sustenance of this complex society. Covering about 50 square kilometers, the Kuhikugu complex is home to over 20 settlements. These aren't just randomly placed, they're strategically positioned to make the most of the region's natural resources. What's fascinating is how these settlements are connected. Imagine a series of straight roads, some stretching for several kilometers, laid out with such precision that they often align with the cardinal directions. This not only facilitated travel, but also shows a high level of planning and coordination. Then there's the canal system, an impressive display of hydraulic engineering, likely used for everything from transportation to water management, and maybe even fish farming. The variety of structures within the complex is equally remarkable. From large public buildings and ceremonial spaces to individual homes, the architecture reflects a hierarchy in building techniques, hinting at different social or functional roles within the society. And speaking of society, estimates suggest that at its peak, Kuhikugu could have supported a whopping 30,000 to 50,000 people. This is deduced from the sheer number of residential structures and the expanse of agricultural land. Uh, along the Amazon, he reported seeing incredible cities, advanced arts and crafts, millions of people, a thriving culture. The rediscovery of the Kuhikugu complex in the Amazon is a fascinating story that blends modern technology with traditional archaeology. Initially, this hidden gem was revealed through aerial surveys and satellite images. Imagine flying over the dense Amazon rainforest and suddenly spotting the outlines of an ancient civilization. Then, archaeologists like Michael Heckenberger and his team took over, conducting extensive ground excavations. They employed advanced techniques like LIDAR, which is like X-ray vision for archaeologists, to see through the forest canopy and map the area accurately. Now let's talk about how old this place is. Using carbon dating, a method to tell the age of artifacts and soil, scientists figured out that people lived in the Kuhikugu complex for several centuries, dating back to as early as 800 AD. They found all sorts of things like pottery, stone tools and ornaments, giving us a glimpse into the daily life and creativity of the people who lived there. Here's the kicker. Before finding Kuhikugu, many thought the Amazon was mostly an untouched wilderness before Europeans arrived. But this discovery turned that idea on its head, showing that the area was home to a large and complex society. It's like finding a hidden chapter of history in your backyard. This place shows us that humans had a big impact on the Amazon way earlier than we thought. They even made their own super fertile soil called Terra Preta, which is still rich and productive today. What's really cool about Kuhikugu is how it shows that the people there knew how to live sustainably. They had advanced farming practices, managed water well, and lived in harmony with their environment. It's like they were eco-friendly before it was trendy. This discovery also made us rethink the role of indigenous societies in the Amazon. It turns out they knew a lot about how to manage the land and shape the landscape. It's a reminder of how important it is to value and learn from indigenous knowledge. And lastly, the biodiversity in the Amazon today might partly be thanks to these ancient civilizations. The variety of plants near these archaeological sites is way more than in other areas of the forest. 
The Amazon is basically a garden. The Amazon is a man-made rainforest. Uh, there are certain trees like Brazil nut trees or the ice cream bean tree, which are food crops, which are very, very valuable. Marajo Island at the Amazon River's mouth is like a time capsule that takes us back to the Marajoara culture, a sophisticated civilization from around 800 to 1400 CE. Imagine an island almost as big as Switzerland, right at the meeting point of a river and the ocean. This place, with its mix of forests, savannas and wetlands, is not just big but also incredibly diverse. It's the perfect backdrop for the Marahuara people to thrive, providing everything from food to resources for their unique lifestyle. Now, the Marahuara culture is something special. They were known for their artistic flair, especially their ceramics. Picture pots and plates with intricate designs, complex patterns and images of animals and people. They weren't just making these for fun. Their ceramics were a big part of their culture and beliefs, like the large, beautifully decorated urns they used for burials. These suggest they had quite complex ideas about life, death and everything in between, but it's not just their art that's fascinating. They built these massive earthen mounds, some over 10 meters high. Think about that. That's like stacking three buses on top of each other. These mounds were probably used for everything from homes to ceremonial sites and might have even protected them from the frequent floods. This shows they were pretty savvy engineers and architects, adapting to their challenging environment in style. The way they organized their society was also quite something. It seems there was a clear hierarchy, with some people leading the way in managing resources and religious practices. And they had different roles for men and women which we can figure out from the things they left behind. Now let's talk about their farming skills. They were ahead of their time, creating raised fields to keep their crops safe from flooding. Their diet was a mix of what they grew, along with fish and game from the surrounding area. And they were smart about managing water with their canals and ditches, which was pretty crucial in a place that floods a lot. Santa Rem, right where the Tapajos meets the Amazon River, is a fascinating place, especially when you think about its history. This spot was like the Grand Central Station of its time, bustling with trade and culture. Picture boats coming in and out, carrying all sorts of goods and ideas from different parts of South America. The area around Santa Rem was rich in resources, which helped the settlement thrive. Now, the people of Santa Rem were known for their incredible pottery. We're talking about really intricate designs here, geometric patterns, pictures of people and animals, and even mythical beings. The level of detail in these pots and plates is just mind-blowing. And it wasn't just about looking good. These designs tell us a lot about their culture and beliefs. The way they made this pottery was pretty advanced too. They had techniques for molding, firing and painting that were way ahead of their time. The variety of colors and the way they used glazes show they really knew their stuff when it came to chemistry and kiln construction. It's like they were the master chefs of pottery, knowing exactly how to cook up the perfect piece. Santa Rem was more than just a local market. It was a cultural hub. The different styles and motifs in the pottery suggest they were mixing it up with all sorts of cultures. And it wasn't just goods they were trading. They were probably swapping stories, ideas and practices too. The town itself, from what we can tell from the ruins, was pretty well organized. They had different areas for living, working and probably for community gatherings or ceremonies. It's like they had their own little urban planning going on. But back to the pottery, it's not just about how it was made, but what it tells us about the people of Santa Rem. It gives us a peek into their daily lives, what they valued, and how they connected with others. The geoglyphs in the Amazon, especially in the Brazilian states of Acre and Rondonia, are like a secret world that's been hidden under the dense forest canopy for centuries. It wasn't until the late 20th and early 21st centuries, mostly because of deforestation, that these incredible earthworks started to come to light, thanks to technology like satellite imagery and LIDAR, which is basically like having X-ray vision from space. Over 450 of these geoglyphs have been mapped. This discovery has completely changed our view of how people lived in the Amazon before Columbus. Now, these aren't just a few lines in the dirt. We're talking about huge designs that can stretch over a kilometer and cover several square kilometers. They come in all sorts of shapes, circles, squares, rectangles, and more intricate forms. Some even have patterns like radial spokes, which add to their complexity. The sheer size of these geoglyphs hints at a society that was really well organized and could bring together a lot of people to create these massive works. But how did they make them? 
Well, they would remove the top layer of soil and vegetation, revealing the lighter colored earth underneath. But before the Aztecs and before the Maya, there were a culture who are referred to as the Olmecs. The settlement story of the Americas is much more complicated uh, than we've, you know, than we than we've realized. And and what the what the DNA is doing is uh, it's telling us that there was something really weird, 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 weird. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, there was a growing fascination with ancient civilizations, particularly in the Victorian era. This interest was driven by a mix of cultural trends in exploration, colonization, and a certain romantic allure attached to discovering lost cultures. Major institutions like museums and universities, primarily in Europe and the US, started funding expeditions to unearth ancient artifacts and understand the history of indigenous civilizations in the Americas. It was a time when archaeology began to evolve from just hunting for treasures to a more scientific approach, focusing on careful excavation and detailed analysis. One of the things I've realized is that there is no classic Native American feature, that, that Na Native Americans are, uh, a very, have a very complex genetic story with very many different elements uh, br brought into it, and we shouldn't be necessarily surprised by the supposedly non-Native American look. Interestingly, during this period, many artifacts, especially the colossal heads and stone structures found in the Olmec region, were often wrongly attributed to other well-known civilizations like the Maya or Aztec. This was largely because the unique aspects of Olmec art and iconography weren't immediately recognized, partly due to a lack of an overall framework to understand the region's history before Columbus. A couple of notable explorers, John Lloyd Stevens and Frederick Catherwood, played a significant role in stirring up interest in Mesoamerican cultures with their explorations and writings, particularly their books on travels in Central America and Yucatan. Their detailed accounts and illustrations captured the public's imagination, sparking a wave of interest in these ancient cultures. While they mainly focused on the Maya, their approach to systematically document their findings and blend travel narratives with scholarly observations greatly influenced future archaeologists studying Mesoamerica. Uh, it's been known by archaeologists for quite a long time that there are anomalous skulls uh, in parts of Brazil, uh, which appear to show uh, very strongly Polynesian or African features, very much like the features that we see mm. on, the, on the Olmec heads. Around this time, there was also a trend in comparative archaeology, where discoveries from different parts of the world were compared, helping to place Mesoamerican civilizations in a global context. Museums began to transition from just storing artifacts to becoming centers of research and education, playing a crucial role in spreading knowledge about ancient cultures. This era also marked the start of interdisciplinary approaches in archaeology, integrating fields like anthropology, linguistics, and early forms of environmental science. This broader, more inclusive approach helped in piecing together a more comprehensive understanding of ancient civilizations, including the intriguing and complex Olmec culture. Back in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, when Western archaeologists were exploring Mesoamerica, they started coming across these massive stone heads. Some of them were over nine feet tall and weighed several tons, with distinctive features like flat noses and fleshy cheeks, often adorned with helmet-like headgear. But here's the thing. Despite their impressive size and unique features, their true cultural significance wasn't immediately understood they're most famous for is these huge carved human heads uh, which can be on a scale of up to 20 to 25 tons which have curious features which have been interpreted variously as Polynesian, African, don't look like classic uh, Native American features. One of the earliest significant findings was made by Jose Melgari Serrano in 1862 at Tres Zapotes in Veracruz. He unearthed what we now know as one of the first Olmec colossal heads. Melgari Serrano even described the head as having Ethiopian features, which tells us a lot about the perceptions and biases of that era. But, and this is crucial, his discovery didn't really spark a broader understanding of the Olmec culture right away. For a long time, these heads were seen more as intriguing oddities rather than pieces of a larger cultural puzzle. It took several decades and a lot more digging before the significance of these heads truly began to be appreciated. 
Initially, many people thought these artifacts might belong to other known civilizations, like the Maya or Aztec, because the idea of the Olmecs being a distinct early Mesoamerican civilization hadn't quite taken shape yet. It wasn't until the mid-20th century, with more systematic excavations led by archaeologists like Matthew Sterling, that the true picture began to emerge. They found more colossal heads and other artifacts, and this really helped to establish the Olmecs as a significant and influential civilization in their own right, predating and possibly even influencing others like the Maya and the Aztecs. Back in 1945, a really important expedition took place, led by this guy named Matthew Sterling. He and his team headed to San Lorenzo, right in the heart of what was once Olmec territory. This wasn't just any random adventure, it was a big deal because the Smithsonian Institution was backing it. They saw the potential in figuring out more about the Olmec sites, which could really shed some light on Mesoamerican prehistory. Before Sterling got there, there had been some poking around in the area, mostly because people kept finding these huge stone heads. These finds were intriguing but didn't quite give the full picture. So enter Sterling. He was already pretty well known in archaeology circles and had a real knack for Mesoamerican cultures. He was the perfect guy to take on such a complex task. Now, it wasn't an easy job. The San Lorenzo site was in this tropical area, covered in thick jungle. Just getting to the site and starting to dig was a huge challenge. They had to clear a bunch of jungle without messing up any artifacts that might be hiding there. And let me tell you, the weather didn't make things any easier. It was humid, unpredictable and not the best for keeping ancient artifacts in one piece. The site itself was huge, spreading out over several kilometers. Sterling and his team had to figure out where to start digging because there was no way they could cover the whole area. They did an initial survey which took a lot of time and planning and then decided on the most promising spots to start excavating. They had to be super careful with how they dug things up. The artifacts were old and fragile, especially with the humidity. Plus, they had to keep track of everything they found, where they found it, and all the details, which was crucial for understanding the site later on. It wasn't something the Maya made up. The Olmecs used that same symbolism. So the Mayan calendar is actually an Olmec calendar. What they found at San Lorenzo was amazing. It turned out to be one of the oldest big cities in Mesoamerica, dating way back to around 1200 to 900 BCE. That's even before civilizations like the Maya and Aztecs that most people are familiar with. The artifacts they unearthed, especially those massive stone heads, were a big deal. They were carved from single blocks of basalt and had all these unique facial features. It was clear that the people who made them were incredibly skilled. All this hard work at San Lorenzo really helped piece together the story of the Olmecs. It gave us a clearer timeline and showed just how complex and advanced their society was. Diving deeper into San Lorenzo, which is super important when it comes to understanding the Olmec civilization, it's considered the oldest major city in Mesoamerica, dating back to around 1200 to 900 BCE. That's way before other famous civilizations like the Maya and Aztecs. Radiocarbon dating was key here. It helped archaeologists nail down the timeline of the site, giving a much clearer picture of when the Olmecs were doing their thing. Now, the most famous stuff they found at San Lorenzo definitely the colossal heads. These huge sculptures were carved from single basalt blocks and are known for their unique facial features like almond-shaped eyes and broad noses. A lot of them have these intricate headdresses too, which might have been a sign of high status or had some ceremonial purpose, but there's still a lot of debate about what all the symbols mean. The size of these heads is just mind-blowing. Some are up to three meters high and weigh around 50 tons. Imagine the skill it took to carve those. But it wasn't just the heads. They found jade figurines and a bunch of different pottery styles, which tell us a lot about their daily life, art, and even trade. The jade stuff suggests they had trade networks because jade wasn't just lying around everywhere. And the buildings. They found large structures like platforms and what might have been houses for the elite. This points to a society that was really well organized and had the resources to build big. The way San Lorenzo was laid out is also fascinating. It had a central axis, which indicates that the city was carefully planned. There were separate areas for ceremonies and living, showing a sophisticated urban structure and hinting at a social hierarchy. All this stuff from San Lorenzo has been super important for understanding the Olmecs. It's given us a much clearer timeline of their civilization and shown just how complex their society was. 
The variety in the artifacts, from the colossal heads to the pottery, shows that they were not only skilled in stone carving, but had artists and craftsmen who were really good at what they did. It's like San Lorenzo has given us a window into a past world, showing us how these ancient people lived, worked, and created. After the exciting discoveries at San Lorenzo in the 1940s, archaeologists turned their attention to La Venta, another key Olmec site in Tabasco, Mexico, in the 1950s. This shift was a big deal because La Venta offered a new window into the Olmec world. Known as one of the earliest complex societies in Mesoamerica, the explorations here were more focused and methodical, thanks to archaeologists like Philip Drucker and Robert Heiser. These guys weren't just digging around, they brought in techniques from other fields like anthropology and geology, giving a fuller picture of the Olmec civilization. La Venta is super important for understanding the peak of Olmec culture. The site was in its prime from around 900 to 400 BCE, a time when the Olmecs were really showing off their artistic and architectural skills. One of the standout features of La Venta is the Great Pyramid. It's not like the pyramids in Egypt, this one's made of earth and clay and has a unique conical shape. It was one of the biggest structures in ancient Mesoamerica at the time, which tells us the Olmecs were pretty good at organizing big construction projects. The pyramid was probably more than just a big building, it's believed to have been a key spot for ceremonies or religious activities, kind of like the heart of Olmec ritual life. The way they built it and other structures at La Venta, and how they aligned them with astronomical bodies, shows they were pretty savvy with engineering and astronomy. It was likely a bustling cultural hub, where significant ceremonies and gatherings happened. When archaeologists started digging at La Venta, they did things a bit differently than before. They were super systematic about it, focusing on layers of soil and the context of each artifact they found. But they had their work cut out for them. The tropical climate and the fact that many Olmec structures were made of earth really made preserving and understanding these finds tough. They had to be meticulous in recording everything they dug up, which has been a gold mine for future analysis. Now, just like at San Lorenzo, La Venta is famous for its massive basalt heads, Carved from huge boulders, these heads are thought to be representations of Olmec rulers or other big shots in their society. But there's more. The site is full of altars with intricate carvings, showing people, animals and all sorts of symbolic scenes. It's like getting a glimpse into their mythology and rituals. And then there's the jade. Laventa turned up loads of jade artifacts from beautifully carved figurines to Celts. These weren't just pretty things to look at. They showed how skilled the Olmecs were and hinted at long trade networks, since jade wasn't just lying around nearby. But here's where it gets really interesting. The burial sites they found were complex, with all kinds of elaborate practices. They also found mosaic pavements made of serpentine and various offerings, which likely had deep religious meaning. All this stuff from La Venta has been super important in piecing together who the Olmecs were, their social structure, religious beliefs, and artistic talents. However, keeping La Venta in good shape for future studies is a challenge, the site's battling both natural elements and human factors, so preserving this amazing place is crucial, not just for archaeology buffs, but for understanding a key part of human history.